Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trader User Group Weekly Roundup for the trading week ending April 19th, 2024. I'm Preston Brent. Thanks for tuning in. Well, the week's theme, as you can see, is jokers to the left, clowns to the right. Interesting markets. You almost have to be uh, uh, into game theory to figure out where this market is going to go. But uh, we've done fairly well. For those of you that listen along in our uh, my weekly blog, um, if you'd listen to what um, I've been saying for the past three months, you'd be doing really well right now. Let's take a look at where the markets are, and we'll just kind of dive in just a little bit into the charts in just one minute. You can see here this past week, everybody in the red except for the Dow, NASDAQ had a very ugly week. It's barely up year to date, 1.8%. It's given up a lot. S&P is the strongest, up a little over 4%. Russell down 4%. You can see here the week started out pretty rough, and it really never got any better with U.S. indexes recording their third consecutive week of losses. Pretty much broad losses, right? I mean, we got concerns with the Middle East, interest rates staying higher for longer, a lot of sentiment that is really um, helping them um, move uh, market price action. Interest rates, inflation, and throw in the presidential election. All of these things are volatility drivers. And if that's not enough, this past week we also got a report showing pension funds were expected to pull about $325 billion from the equity markets in 24. And that's almost double what they pulled out of equity markets last year in 23. They pulled about $191 billion out of the equity markets. And finally, one stat for you guys. Every time the S&P has moved below the 50-day moving average, typically it goes on over the next 90 days or so to go down another 5%. Now, I'm not saying that's what's going to happen here. We'll take a look at the charts, and I'll show you where we got some pretty good hard support. But all in all, the markets are kind of lining up the way I've talked about here for the past two months. You can see the P.E. trailing ratio, very expensive at 22.59, Ford P.E. 20.65. That's still, um, even though it's a little bit about 8.5% lower than the trailing 12, to me it's still higher than it should be. Dividend yield at the S&P comes in at 1.44s. 10-year Treasury, a little bit over 4.5 at 4.6%, 4.61%. Earnings yield is holding strong at 4.89 for the S&P. But if you look at the 10-year uh, Treasury and the earnings yield, it's not that much different between the two. So, um, And then the VIX uh, closed out the week at 18.71. Prior week, it was 17.31. So over the past three weeks, the VIX has slowly crept up from lows to you know close out the week. So it was up 8.01% for the week. You could see the best performers for the week. Well, there was really not that many. Utilities came in on top at 1.92. Look at um, technology. They're really ugly. I mean, they came in at uh, a minus 6.29%. Best for the year, energy, 14.19. Worst, of course, real estate coming in at a negative 9.83% with interest rates forecast to stay higher for longer. I mean, we would expect that. I mean, we did get stronger economic data this week so that tend to increase worries that the feds are going to push back any interest rate cuts this year so that's normal we got retail sales that came in i uh, pushed the 10-year uh, note to its highest level intraday since last year late last year in addition we got the cpi uh, up three and a half percent year over year and in the prior month before that it was at 3.2 so the cpi actually moved up a little bit and then, you know, to make matters even worse, uh, Boom Boom Powell, the Fed chair, early this past week, he came out and said that with all the recent data, economic data that we're given, it's not given us confidence that uh, a rate hike is going to be on the, uh, I mean, sorry, a rate cut's going to be on the table anytime soon. And then on top of that, we got the New York Fed, President Williams. He warned that a rate hike is not our baseline, but one is possible. So he was the first one to introduce a rate hike, right? So that obviously didn't really go over well with the markets. And then we got um, Bostic. He came out and said no rate cuts. He doesn't say until the end of this year. So all in all, the Fed governors really didn't help the sentiment in the market. In fact, they pushed back. We started out the year with five potential rate cuts. Now we're down to less than two for the year. So market action is basically adjusting valuations, PE ratios, valuations, and reducing 
weighting in certain sectors to accommodate that, as you can see with some of the technology stuff, right? Now, if we come over and look at what's going on across the pond, let's take a look at Europe. Just about everybody was in the red except for the CAC 40, but year to date, they're much stronger than the U.S. Euro stocks, which are the 50 largest companies across Europe, they're up over 8.5, 8.7%. CAC 40 is up 6.35, DAX up. So they're all, you know, they're in the green, not kicking, kicking the ball out of, hitting the ball out of the park, but still fairly solid, right? The CAC 40 of the French was the only one in the green this week. Um, we did see in the U.K., Inflation grew at an annual 3.2%, so that was down from 3.4 the prior month. But um, <clears throat> they were expecting a little bit better than that in the UK. Services inflation still is relatively high. It did slow to 6% from 6.1. But they're still saying higher oil prices in the UK and somewhat sticky inflation. Um, markets are expecting the UK not to cut in June. Meanwhile, the ECB, a lot of their Policymakers are saying that June is a likely target date for them to lower the rates by 25 basis points, which are, you know, uh, diverging a little bit from the U.S. Fed. And then, of course, if we look over the Asian markets, you can see the Nick I had probably the ugliest week of all the major indexes. It was down 6.16 percent. Now, keep in mind, it was up year to date over 16, 17 percent. It's still up double digits year to date, 10.84, but still a very, very ugly week. I mean, the yen which is kind of perceived as a safe haven. It actually moved up a little bit this week, uh, but it's still hovering around 34 year lows. And there's a lot of expectation on when the Bank of Japan is gonna you know, um, start kicking the yen up by selling the dollar and buying the yen. And traders are trying to make that trade, but they haven't done it yet. So it's still with the low yen, uh, then their exports are up higher, uh, you know, because the yen is a lot cheaper. It's the fourth consecutive month of growth in Japan for exports with that low yen, right? So that's that's helping them out. That's why they're up still double digits year to date with all the, the mess we've had um, in this past month of trading, okay? Then, of course, if we go over to China, they're another one in the green this week, 1.52 year to date up over 3%. But one of the reasons why this week was fairly okay for China, their GDP expanded at 5.3% in Q1 from a year ago. Remember, they were forecasting 5% for the year for GDP. Um, they were expecting 5.2 in the number this this uh, this past week, but they got 5.3. So uh, on a quarterly basis, their economy grew about 1.6%, and that was from 1.4% expansion in uh, Q4 of last year. So a little bit of growth. However, industrial production retail sales still growing at a slower than expected rate. Right. And then on the monetary front, the PBOC is still putting more money into their banking systems. So they're still trying to stimulate their way out of this. Finally, new home sales over in, in, in China, real estate, it continued to fall in March. So overall, real estate is just acting as a horrendous drag on the overall markets in China. So we'll see how that thing plays itself out. What I want to do is shift over to the screens real quick. Let's take a look at some of the key indexes here. We'll start off with the E-mini S&P 500 futures first. Um, and you'll see here it's kind of going along uh, based on the way we forecasted, you know, the way I've been talking about this here in our user group. Um, and you can see on the screen here, um, just looking at it, <clears throat> you can see that the markets um, are down a pretty good little bit. You know, but in the scheme of things, after being up, you know, 35 percent since October of last year, now they're still up, but not as much. You can see it's hitting my target. That's the near term target. Further out in time target is around 49.50. Let's call it 49.50. Um, I think you can see the the uh, candle here. It looks like a hammer. Typically, when you get a hammer, that means we can expect a little bit of upside action here. But you can see we blew through the 50 EMA. We attempted a retest, didn't really hold out. And this is where we're sitting. What I'm telling my members here is be careful um, with the way this price action has um, moved about. We could expect a little bit of a move up here like that. Possibly the 50 EMA as it's moving down, we move up and then we come down and make a new low, take out this low right here. And this is where we'll begin our consolidation phase before we stake and make another run. So this is the higher probability move right now uh, in the S&P. All right. So you don't want to get trapped in this move higher. I mean, what you can do um, is basically just 
readjust some of your portfolios the park as the markets uh do this counter trend rally i do expect a counter trend rally a little bit here uh, remember, this week we get four majors uh, coming out of the MAG-7, although a lot of people are arguing that Tesla shouldn't be in it, neither should Apple. But speaking of Tesla, we get Tesla after markets close on Tuesday. We get Meta after markets close on Wednesday. And then Thursday after markets close, we get Google and Microsoft. Microsoft is the one I'm going to be following very, very closely. All right. That's the first one where we can see if they're actually making money on AI because they've come out with their uh, – um, was it co-pilot and they're charging $30 a month for it. So we're going to see in the numbers there, you know, are they able to recognize revenue on that? And if they do, you're going to see Microsoft take off and you'll see that's going to help NASDAQ. And we'll get that bump that I'm looking for sometime over the next week or two before we roll back over and get a final low. Remember, we got on May 1st, the Fed's meeting again. That's when we'll get boom, boom, Powell. And they're going to be pushing back an interest rate cut. I don't think a rate hike will be on the table out of coming out of boom boom powell's mouth but just pushing back on the cut um or the timing of the cuts it's going to be really crucial to where we're going to go in may and i do believe we got another downside action going through into may into uh june time frame and then we're going to settle in a little bit and then we'll start to see a move remember we got Really, June is when we get a harder number out of the, of the Fed. That's when we get their dot plot because they only do that once a quarter. And that'll give us an idea of what are they thinking over the next 12 months. What are each of the Fed governors thinking? But this is where you can see the market action right here. Let me show you NASDAQ. NASDAQ has really taken a hit. A lot of tech has taken a hit. It was down 368 points on Friday. You can see NASDAQ is just barely in the green, right? Now, this Elliott wave count would suggest we're going to get a bounce up and then we're going to roll back over and make a new low, all right, along with the S&P. Um, and if I were to come in here and show you the, um, uh, let me show you the uh, FANG index. The FANG index um, really took a hit this past week. It moved below the 50 EMA. Now, this only includes, this is not the MAG7 index. It's Microsoft, Meta, Apple, Google, and Amazon, right? And when this gave it up, none of the other stocks really held up very well. Although if we look at the equal weight SPX, uh, you can see here, it actually had an up day on Friday. So that's a good thing, right? We're seeing some money flow out of tech. We're seeing some sector rotation coming out of some of these mega cap tech companies and going into others um, that are kind of holding this up above uh, and that's helping the markets a little bit. And then, of course, if we look at the Russell, which is the ugliest index out there. Uh, let me just find the rut here. I know it's 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 somewhere around here. Uh, where are we on the rut? Uh, come here, boy. I know you're in here. Here we go right here. It actually finished in the green on Friday. But you could see you could see that long candle actually intraday close below the 200 and then move back up. But I will tell you from the all time highs of the rut which were made back on, um, let's just take it out, back on uh, November 8th, 2021 at 2460. We are in an official bear market in the Russell Index, right? At some point, the rut is going to be a dynamite trade to take. What I'm looking at is if we can get a little bit of a, a, a bear flat, a, a bear tra or bull trap where we roll up a little bit and then we roll back down, make new lows, consolidate, that would be a good time to pick up some rut. Right. I think it's going to take off uh, members. We'll go into more detail on that this weekend on our uh, weekly market watch Sunday. OK, now, if we come down here and look at um, volatility, if we look at the VIX, you can see the VIX is just, you know, it moved into the red, but then it still managed to close back here. We were intraday. We were up around twenty one thirty five. Then it closed back down. You can see my regression channel if I just kind of zoom out a little bit here. You can see how it slowly moved up and the VIX has been moving up really very stealthily since middle of December of last year. I've been pointing this out every week. I said, be careful because even though the markets are moving higher, so is the VIX. We had a little bit of minor respite here where it moved below, but the minute it went back up, man, it just took off. Okay. So this is what we're going to be watching also. Um, uh, this coming week when we get some of this key data out. And then Friday, we get some really important data. That's the um, <clears throat> Bureau of um, Economic. We get the um, 
uh, uh, PCE, producer consumption expenditures. That is a Fed preferred gauge. That is going to be a big number, even bigger than the CPI. So there's going to be a lot of eyeballs on that Friday morning before the markets open. Okay. Then, of course, if we come down here and look at treasuries, this is one of the worst starts of the treasuries in over 65 years, believe it or not. We hit a low here on April 16th, down 8.94%. Okay. So even though you may be holding bonds, and you're collecting some interest overall you're losing money right and that's not a good thing i tell folks that are working with me that if you're going to put money in treasury stay on the short end of the curve right now all right less than six months if you just want to park money um, do t-bills and then just wait it out because i do believe we're going to make another run higher just not right now okay and then of course if we come down and look at currencies the dollar is making new highs um, you could see here it had a new high on April 16th, up 4.4%. Um, and the reason why is we're diverging from Europe. Europe is basically looking at cutting rates sooner than we are. So that keeps the U.S. interest rates higher for longer. And by doing that, basically, it just creates a bifurcation between the U.S. dollar and the euro, which means the euro is going to be moving lower. And of course, if we look at the euro, you can look at this daily chart, even though it moved up slightly on Friday, you can say we made new lows on the same day the dollar made new highs for the year. On April 16th, euro is down about 4%, okay? So no one forecasted a strong dollar this year. Everybody was forecasting a strong euro, including me as well. And then when I saw price action revert back, I came back out and said, you gotta reverse course. I don't see the euro doing this because of the bifurcation between our feds and the feds or the ECB and the Bank of England over there in Europe. So you just have to, you know, just kind of reverse the trade. The one thing that's very hard for a lot of traders to do is admit your bias is wrong and then shift. If you can't do that, it's going to be very hard for you and you'll stick with a loser a lot longer than you really should. So get that in your noggin. If you're wrong on your bias, then be ready to shift the trade. And trust me, no one is right all the time. In fact, if you're a very good trader, you'll be right, you know, in the low 60s, 65% of the time, and then you manage your risk and you do very well. If you're a day trader, you can actually be right 35% of the time, maybe 40 or maybe 32% of the time and still make money because it's all in how you manage when you're wrong. Okay. Um, but anyway, this is what I see in the currency market. And then, of course, if we come down here and look at gold, gold is hovering around their highs that it made on the 12th of uh, April up, you know, at that point, intraday, you could see it's up over 18 percent. OK, now who's buying all this gold? Clearly, it's not gold miners and others. A lot of the retail traders are out. A lot of central banks, Russia, uh, China some European central banks, South American central banks are buying a lot of gold, right? With all the political turmoil on uh, the dollar getting stronger and some of them like China and Russia trying to get off the dollar. So there are big buyers of gold right now. I think when the rest of the market catches up and they start buying gold as well, it can go higher. For now, I wouldn't touch it up here as I've told our members. You've got that there is no divergence on the MACD. That does suggest any dip. I'm looking for a dip. Any dip should be bought in gold. Same thing with silver. If we take a look at the silver markets, um, you can see it's hovering near the highs. Any dip should be bought. You don't want to be short uh, silver unless you're day trading and it's trading a little bit of a pullback. That would I could understand. But longer term, you're going to be neutral to bullish in silver and gold. That's the way I'd see it. Now, oil, it's it's keeping inflation sticky. You can look at oil here. It did hit a new high on April 12th. It was up 22.85%. Any move lower here is probably going to be bought. It's an Elliott Wave 3. Traditionally, you got a 3, 4, 5. So that would suggest, and look at the MACD, there is no divergence that does suggest oil could dip a little bit lower before we move back up again. And there's still a fear premium in the price of oil, probably 2 or $3 a barrel. <laughs> just because of the Middle East tension. So let's see how this thing plays itself out. But I do believe neutral to higher, any dip should be bought in the oil market. Nat gas, it is definitely, in my mind, you want to be long-term long, Nat gas. It does not stay down here very long, right? There are fun ways to play this. Members, we'll look at it on our weekly market watch this Sunday evening.
Okay. And then one other thing that's keeping gasoline prices up, obviously oil, but this is going to keep inflate. Now, this is a daily chart, and you can see as we bounce from one contract to another, it's still high, right? I mean, so gas, higher gasoline prices for longer is going to keep upward pressure at the pump for prices, which is going to keep upward pressure on um, inflation. All right, everybody, that's a real quick sound bite on some of the major uh, markets uh, that we're seeing right now. Members, I'll see you Sunday evening. We'll go through this in a little bit more detail and some of the opportunities I see out there. Otherwise, have a really great uh, weekend. Members, I'll see you Sunday evening at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ciao, folks.